Trump supporters now being targeted by Judge Juan Mercan. In his jury questionnaire, we have the instructions that he is proposing. We know trial is about to start any day now. April 15th is the drop dead date. And it doesn't look like that's being moved because the New York Court of Appeals has denied Trump's attempts to adjourn this case so that he can, you know, have due process of law, properly prepare for the case, review the discovery, get access to the materials that he needs to properly defend himself. They said, you're good. Okay, we need you convicted before the election. And so we'll see you in court on Monday, starting with jury selection. So we'll take a look at what happened with the appeals, but then we're going to zoom in on the jury rules and the questions. And you'll notice the judge wants to know about Oath Keepers and Proud Boys and other groups that are usually associated with the right and conveniently forgets about some of the groups on the left. And we wonder why he's targeting those groups. Well, probably because he wants to check them off, make sure they're not on the board because they might be Trumpers. So we got that. The media got rules on how they're going to be reporting for this trial. So we'll talk about it and some reaction from a state AG, Whitaker, on the Trump trial saying, yeah, he's going into a corrupt, beastly den. And so we're going to have to just deal with it. But here is the quick background on what happened with the Court of Appeals. So Trump is losing, says the Reuters, a bid to delay the hush money trial, which is what they're calling it. We're calling it the Bragg prosecution. It's just another, you know, hack prosecutor prosecuting some hack case. And it is not a delay. It's an adjournment because they dumped a bunch of additional discovery on Trump. They've accelerated this case. Remember that we were supposed to be in the middle of the Judge Chutkin trial until that one got taken up on appeal. And so this case was actually not really on the docket until they reaccelerate. Oh, perfect. Chutkin's case got moved. So since all of the other trials are now kind of on a hiatus, we're just going to accelerate this one. Make sure we get Trump at least convicted in New York on this ridiculous case before the election is over. So Trump has been filing requests to try to postpone it. And it's not looking like that's going to happen, surprisingly. Trump on Tuesday lost his second last ditch bid in as many days to delay his April 15th trial. Former president and his lawyers argued at a mid-level hearing that the trial should be delayed so he can challenge the gag order because it is irrevocable, right? You can't unring this bell. Once Trump is gagged in the middle of a political season, in the middle of 2024, you can't fix this. At the end of a normal criminal trial, you say, oh man, we got to the conclusion, the jury found him guilty, but there was a real big problem in this trial. There was an evidentiary problem or that cop lied or this prosecutor did something bad. Whatever. Okay, well, that stinks, but guess we got to do it again. Okay, so we just do the trial over again if the prosecutor's not willing to dismiss the case or whatever. So here, the question that main argument is Trump is saying, hey, we can't do this election over again, so we have to be able to speak now. And one of the main points of free speech is that you can challenge, petition your government for a redress of grievances, especially if you're running for office, especially if you're in the public needing to know about the person who's running for office and their opinions on the system that they happen to be in. So Associate Justice Cynthia Kern swiftly denied the delay request, meaning this is probably not going anywhere, but a full panel of appeals judges will later consider the Republican candidate's underlying challenge to the gag order. So it will reviewed by another body, but that other body is going to be scheduled to review the hearing on Monday, right? The same day we start jury selection. So we'll see if that goes anywhere. Now, Stephen Chung, a spokesman for Trump's campaign, said in a statement he called the trial a witch hunt. Separate judge on Monday denied another request to delay Trump's trial, saying he needed to move this out of the jurisdiction. Lawyers said that Manhattan residents had a major antipathy towards him. 61% of respondents thought Trump was guilty. 70% had a negative opinion. Now, at Tuesday's hearing, Emil Bove for Trump said Mercan's order restricting his public comment should be modified. Allow him to respond to people who are levering criticism at him, right? Stormy Daniels released a whole documentary, right? Not that kind of a documentary, I think. I haven't actually seen it, so who knows? But the new one is on Peacock, perfect platform for her, and it's all about the Trump case. It's all about you know, Stormy's life and the you know heroism that she has gone through as a victim of Trump's brutality, whatever. Now, same thing with Michael Cohen. He's on Jen Psaki's show all the time, talking to her about how Trump is you know doomed, whatever. Mercan imposed the gag order, and and then he protected his own daughter. That's how cowardly he is, right? Don't you talk about my daughter. Just like Angeron said, don't you talk about my Greenfield. The judge expanded the order to cover his relatives, his daughter who literally works for Joe Biden, literally. The order does not restrict Trump's speech about Mercan or Bragg, but it talks about his daughter, who is the most corrupt part of this entire entity. Now, he also said his office had to increase scrutiny of security due to Trump's statements. Okay, I'm sure. Michael Cohen, we know the rest of this story. So apparently, you know, this is being appealed. It's under appeal, and they're going to have a follow up hearing very soon on this. My understanding is it's the same day that trial starts. So in other words, they're not going to delay the trial. It's already in the middle of jury selection. Now, Mercan is expecting this to happen. Okay, he's not changing this date either. He says, we've got some jury instructions and here's how it is going to work, my friends, when you show up on Monday. This was emailed over to both sides, Todd Blanche for Trump and Joshua Steinglass for Bragg. Here's what Mercan says. All right, trial starting on Monday. So here we're talking about about jury.
jury selection. Now, this letter is going to address three things. One, how we're going to be excusing jurors. Number two, instructions about the use of an anonymous jury. And three, the jury questionnaire and the permissible scope of voir dire. Okay, so the questions the jury will be asked and how we're going to ask further questions of them. So he says, look, now excusing jurors. If a juror self-identifies as being unable to serve, anybody in here who can't serve for any reason, they raise their hand. The court typically conducts jury selection in the following matter. Mercon says, I usually read the caption, Bragg versus Trump, and introduce the defendant and counsel. I identify the charges against the defendant, outline the nature of the case, and provide a brief summary of the allegations. Now, the court invited the parties to give us a summary, oh man, of the case. This is so gross. So the court invited the parties to submit a one paragraph summary of the case to be read to the jurors, right? The judge is going to basically frame the case out. It's like your introduction paragraph. Now, the parties were unable to agree on the language, and therefore we got separate versions. Now, after carefully considering the proposed versions, the court has crafted what I believe, ugh, is a fair and appropriate narrative of the case. Is he going to call it a federal insurrection case again? Trump is a federal insurrection defendant, you know, whatever, including the defendant denies the allegations. Now, the summary is attached. We'll read it. The purpose of the narrative is to provide the prospective jurors a fair and balanced summary and to assist them with understanding the nature of the case. The purpose is not to instruct the jury on the law, nor is it to present competing arguments. So we'll see how you guys feel about that instruction. Writing, I explained the judge, among other things, what an indictment is, my process, basic principle about the law. You can't hold somebody not testifying against them. I'll explain to the jurors that the observance of Passover does not preclude them from serving. And I conclude my preliminary instructions. I read the following. Okay, now that you've heard my instructions, some basic information, let me know. Please do not wait until you, after you've been selected to tell me you can't be fair and impartial. Is there anyone here who can't serve? Let me know now by raising your hand, right? I'm not going to excuse you because of inconvenience, blah, blah, blah. So I then invite those jurors who have self-identified who wish to be excused. The judge says, this is what I'm going to tell them. Then they're going to raise their hands if they, you know, anybody who can't handle it, line up at the rail, approach the bench individually and explain why they should be excused. Now, I then invite them to come up. Now, we are joined at the bench by the defense, the prosecution, the court reporter, at least one or more court clerks if they've not waived their rights. And in my experience, the vast majority, if not all, who have self-identified as being unable to serve are in fact excused at this stage, right? So he says, I normally do this and I normally bring them up and ask them questions. Now in the matter in a previous case, when I handled a prior Trump case, so this judge has been on this like multiple Trump cases. He says, I presided over this one in 2022. I propose that we just stop interviewing them if they say I can't serve. Okay, so the ordinary ways they come, I can't serve. Oh yeah, why not? Oh uh, yeah, because you got a bad knee. That's too bad. Get a brace. See in court, right? One of those things. So now the judge is saying, well, I didn't really want to ask people why they can't serve. And the reason probably reading between the lines here is probably because these are honest people who say, I hate Trump. Hey, how about you? I hate this guy's guts. Oh, thanks. Next person. How about you? Yeah, same. Hate him. How about you? Hate. Oh yeah. Hate him. I love Hillary Clinton. She's my hero. Hey, how about you? Love huge Joe Biden fan, right? So he's like, so how about we just don't ask? Okay. Don't ask, don't tell policy on why the jurors are unable to serve. So back then the defense counsel at that prior case, they objected. They said, what? No, like we want to know why. Like, we want to know if it's a legitimate excuse or not. Now he says, and we deferred. And so while most Supreme Court trials typically involve one or two defense attorneys or one or two prosecutors, we had four and we had equal prosecutor. We had a bunch of people here. And so the process described above couldn't be conducted at the bench. All right. So the judge just says, oh, there's too many people up here. Eh, we don't want everybody coming up here. And so the process was time consuming, not enough room, right? The judge is going to get rid of a critical point of the case because there's not enough room. <laughs> okay. So the process was time consuming and it was unproductive. So upon finishing the first jury panel, then we dispense now that the defense counsel consented, we got rid of the individual interviews. And so then we accelerated the process. Maybe, so maybe they accelerated it. So then in the instant matter, we're going to have all those people even even more plus Trump and the secret service. And the jury room is not large enough to accommodate this. And so this would require everyone going to the 15th floor if we want to go through this. And in a case where security concerns are now implicated, moving the entire jury panel is simply not going to happen. So against this backdrop, the court proposed eliminating the individual's interviews of the jurors. If they say, hey, I can't be on here. Now, after some suggestions and discussion, Mr. Blanche, Trump's lawyer in this case, shout out, says, okay, well, how about we do a hybrid system? Okay. But they say that Mr. Blanche offered no alternative. Yeah, right. No practical alternative, right? So the judge says, well, I don't like that idea. So this court finds, after very careful consideration, that requiring individual inquiry of every juror who has already identified that they can't be fair or they're unable to serve, we don't really know why, is unnecessary. We're not going to do it. So the first department is held. It was not an error to do this. And so I'm allowed to do this. And so all this case law says I'm authorized to do this. And so we're not going to interview them if they say, 
I'm unfit to serve. Just, okay, fine, have a nice life, got that. So point one is done. Now how about point two, about an anonymous jury? They say on March 7th, this court issued its decision in order on Bragg's motion for a protective order regulating the disclosure of juror information. Here's what I said back then, says the judge. So I ordered that the people's motion for a protective order restricting the disclosure of business or residential addresses other than to lawyers is granted, right? So only attorneys get sensitive info of the jurors. Also ordered that Bragg's motion to prohibit the disclosure of juror names other than to parties other than counsel is also granted, including Trump staff and other people, consultants and so on. So juror information goes to everybody other than the public. And also that the people in the counsel for Trump shall jointly submit to this court proposed neutral explanations to minimize prejudice. Okay, so when explaining why something is happening or not, they're unable to agree on language, they can submit proposals. Now the parties were unable again to come to an agreement and we got separate instructions. Now we know that the process of summoning thousands of additional jurors and imposing all of these necessary measures is a lot. And we have a lot of people working on this. Commissioner of jurors for the county. We got you know, all these people working on it and they formulated a plan. Now in his proposal, Trump requests that his proposed instruction not be read to jurors unless they express concerns about the public attention in the case. The court will make clear, make every effort to not necessarily alert the jurors to the reality that this will be anonymous, right? So the defense doesn't want the jurors to be told that they're like in danger. This is an anonymous jury because like you guys are in danger or something. Why? Because Trump? Oh, great, guilty. However, as a necessary measure to ensure anonymity, the jurors must be given an instruction before they enter the courtroom when they arrive in the jury room. And so we've drafted some instructions and here's the instruction. Now the court and both parties have agreed your names will not be publicly disclosed. Further, your addresses will not be shared. We're doing this to preserve your privacy and you may not draw any inferences in favor or you know against either party or result of this order. And you might say that's pretty you know reasonable. You know, the downside from the public's perspective is that the defense attorneys miss something, right? So we've seen other cases where jurors were very problematic. I think of the Derek Chauvin case to be more specific. There was one juror on that case who said that he was fair and impartial, even though he went to a George Floyd protest sometime before. Okay, so the guy who's judging Derek Chauvin, who was now convicted for murder, went to a George Floyd protest. So that's fair and impartial, according to the DA there. Now, on February 21st, Assistant DA Steinglass informed the court that pursuant to the court request, we conferred further and have reached an agreement to several of the proposed jury questions. We're now in the jury questionnaire. We're going to get to some of the questions targeting the Trumpers here in a minute. So they say, we continue to disagree. So we're not going to come to a similar conclusion. Now, the judge tells us the court has closely scrutinized all the proposed questions that are going to be on the jury questionnaire, including those to which the parties have agreed to. Now, guided by legal authority and the requirements under the law, the court has modified some and we've excluded others. Now, the resulting questionnaire that the jurors will get is broad and exhaustive, says the judge. 42 questions we'll take a look at, many of which contain sub-questions covering all the relevant areas of the inquiry. Please note no questions asking the jurors whom they voted for or who they intend to vote for or whom they've made political contributions to. Yeah, you definitely don't want to know that in New York because we know where that's going to lead us. Nor are the jurors asked about their specific political party registration, though the answer to that question may be easily gleaned from the responses to other questions. Yes, counsel is forewarned not to seek to expand the degree of intrusion beyond what's already been approved. Now, they say turning to counsel's questions of the jurors, the court shall not permit questioning that is repetitious, and I have discretion to narrow the scope of the inquiry. And so thus, contrary to Trump's arguments, the purpose of the jury selection is not to determine whether they like or dislike the parties. No, that's irrelevant. The ultimate issue is can they set aside those feelings or biases? I hate Donald Trump's guts. Oh, really? That's too bad. Can you set that aside here while you're judging him on trial to see if you can convict him? Can you set that aside? Yes, I can. Clearly, I'm a good lefty liberal. I'm all for equal law protection. No one's above the law. All right, you see how this goes. So most, if not all jurors, bring some dispositions. It's only when it's shown that there is a substantial risk that it's gonna affect their ability to discharge their duties, does it become a problem? And so counsel is reminded that a challenge for cause to boot these jurors off only be made on the ground that they're not qualified by the judiciary law. And so he's putting some pretty, you know, nice roadblocks up to stop Trump from kicking off good jurors for their side. Indeed, it appears that counsel for Trump is in agreement. Of course, the mere fact that someone's a Democrat or a Republican does not give either party, I would submit, the right to strike for cause. It's amazing. This judge is such a piece of work. He, and he's quoting the defense like, oh, you agree with me. And he's just pulling something from their transcript. Yeah, you're probably right, but it's not going to be the mere fact. It's going to be a lot more than that, right? So here is the statement that the judge cobbled together. He 
says, okay, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my friends, you're playing jury today. So you come in, you sit down, you have no idea what the heck's going on. Never been on a jury panel before. Judge comes out, reads this for you, says, all right, the allegations are in substance that Donald Trump falsified business records to conceal an agreement with others to unlawfully influence the 2016 presidential election. And so we're asking ourselves, okay, how is that? What crime was that? What are you charging there? Specifically, it is alleged that Trump made or used false business records, right? Which is this case to hide the true nature of the payments made to Michael Cohen by characterizing them as payment for legal services rendered pursuant to a retainer agreement. So it is literally Cohen sent an invoice. They put it into a ledger. Then the ledger caused the check to be written, which went back over to Michael Cohen. It's a simple retainer agreement. They said every single one of those is a different felony. So crime, crime, crime every single month. That's how you get the 34 charges. The people allege brag that the payments were intended to reimburse Michael Cohen for money that he paid to Stormy in the weeks before the election to prevent her from public revealing details about a past encounter with Trump. So Trump has pleaded not guilty and denies the allegations. And we're asking ourselves about what the other crime was, right? In under New York law, it's you're falsifying the business records in order to conceal another crime that's being committed. And we're asking ourselves, what is that other crime? Time will tell. Now, this is what they get. This gets printed out. Hey, juror, please take part D of your juror summon. And in the upper right hand corner is going to be your number and do this. You will be called and identified only by this number and respond when you get called. Now, when they sit down, they get a clipboard, they get a pen. These are the questions that the Trump jurors will get. When you're finished answering, we're going to move on to the next seated juror until every juror has had the opportunity to answer. Oh, this is what they're going to ask them in court. Okay. So it's not actually a written questionnaire. Depending on your answer, we may have follow-up questions. When you're finished answering all of these, we're going to go to the next juror until every juror has had the opportunity to answer. Okay. So it sounds like it's like, Hey, your answer's out. We're going to just go through the line. Give us your answers. Got it. Okay. Without telling us your address, where do you live? Upper East side, lower West side, wherever, how long you live there. You a native New Yorker? If not, when'd you move? What do you do for a living? How long you been doing that? And if you're retired, what'd you do before you retired? Who's your current employer? How large are they? Are you self-employed? Do you own your own business? Who's your prior employer? And what's your educational background, Mr. Juror? High school, diploma, college degree, graduate degree. Are you married? Have you ever been married? Do you have any kids? If you are married or living with another adult, what does that person do? If you have adult children, what do they do? What do you do in your spare time? Do you plan insurrections? Do you have any interests or hobbies? Do you participate in organizations or advocacy groups, right? That's a broad question. Which one's there? Have you ever served on a jury before? If you did, please tell us how long ago. Was it criminal, civil, or grand jury? And without telling us the verdict, did they reach a verdict? Now, which of the following print publications, cable and or network programs, or online media, such as websites, blogs, or social media, do you visit? Huh. So if you're on the jury panel, got to fill this out. New York Times, USA Today, Huffington Post, Daily News, CNN, MSNBC, Google, Facebook, X, TikTok, Wall Street Journal, New York Post, Newsday, Washington Post, Fox News, Newsmax, MSNBC, Yahoo, and True Social. Eh, any juror who marks that is gone. Kick, pff, you're gone. You're deleted. In fact, probably charged with a crime. I don't follow the news is the last one. So you see a couple of these boxes. Prosecutors are going to be checking those off. Defense attorney is going to be looking it. You know, every other one of these is essentially like if they're Washington Post, if they're Daily News, New York Times, let's if they're Huffington Post example, you're going, uh oh, okay. Here's a question. Do you listen to or watch podcasts? If so, which one? Watching the watchers? Off that jury so fast. Yeah, be gone. Do you listen to talk radio? If so, which programs? Which are basically all, you know, conservative, most of them, like Sean Hannity, you know. Have you a relative or a close friend ever been the victim of a crime? Standard question. If so, please briefly asked, tell us what happened. Do you have some you know, feelings about the justice system after having been the victim of a crime? Have you or a relative or close friend ever been employed by law enforcement? Got, you know, feds, police in the chat, in the jury. Have you or a relative ever been employed by the government? Have you ever been employed in the accounting or the finance field? Because this is an accounting crime, so-called. Have you, a relative or a close friend, ever had any education, training, or work experience in the legal field? Are you going to commandeer the jury? Have you or anyone ever had any experience which cause you to form an opinion about police? If so, what was that experience? And would that experience prevent you from being fair and impartial? New York jurors are asked, have you, a relative or close friend, ever been accused or convicted of committing a crime? You have a pending criminal case. Question 21, do you have any political, moral, intellectual, or religious beliefs that stop you from following the court's instructions? Same thing that would prevent you from rendering a verdict. Any religious, moral objections? Any health conditions might cause a problem? You take any medications that might stop you from 
being able to concentrate. Don't tell us the names, but let us know if you're on them. Hunter Biden's off the list. Court proceedings normally end around 4.30. Can you make it through that? Would your schedule allow you to do that? Do you practice any religion that would prevent you from sitting here on a weekday or weeknight? Can you give us assurance that you're going to be fair and impartial and not base your decision against a person who may appear on this case based on the person's race, color, origin, ancestry, gender, gender identity, expression, religious views, blah, 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 all the way up to political views, right? Politics. Can you be fair and impartial? Can you promise to guard against allowing stereotypes or bias to influence you? Do you have a relative or a close friend? Has anyone ever worked for any of the Trump companies? If you are, maybe you might like him. Maybe you need to go. Have you, a relative or a close friend, ever worked or volunteered for a Trump presidential campaign, Trump presidential administration, any other political entity affiliated with Trump? Do you work for the New York government? Like, do you work for the government? Do you have a predisposition to believing the government since your employer's a government, you get paid by the government? So in other words, if somebody worked for Trump, they're conflicted. Okay, well, what if somebody works for the government that employs Alvin Bragg? Are they conflicted too? Have you ever attended a rally or a campaign event for Trump? Or how about Bragg? Or how about Tish James? Or how about Angeron? Or any of these other people in this vicinity? Ever attend their events? Any questions on that, Judge? Let's see. Are you signed up for, or have you ever been subscribed to, or followed any newsletter or email listserv run on behalf of Mr. Trump or the Trump organization? So do you get Trump emails? Again, no Alvin Bragg email questions. No Tish James questions. Do you follow Donald Trump on any social media, or have you done so in the past? If you do, might need to go. Have you, a relative, or a close friend ever worked or volunteered for any anti-Trump group or organization? Hmm, we'll see if they answer honestly this time. Have you ever attended a rally or any campaign event for any anti-Trump group or organization? And again, like we've seen where they've lied about this, we saw in the Derek Chauvin case, a very similar question was asked, and the juror lied about that, and there was no recourse, there was no appeal, nothing. Have you ever signed up for or followed any newsletter or any email listserv run by on behalf of any anti-Trump group or organization? And again, you know, we're going to see like what that means. What is an anti-Trump group? Is Bragg anti-Trump? I would say yes. Anybody make a donation to Bragg? Anybody support work for them? Newsletter for Bragg? He's pretty anti-Trump. How about the entire DNC? They're going to say, no, no, it's just a Hillary Clinton thing. Do you currently follow any anti-Trump group or organization on social media? Have you done so in the past? They're not going to identify them themselves as anti-Trump. They're pro-America. So here's a big question, right? That you see how this balance weighs out. Have you ever considered yourself a supporter or belong to any of the following, the QAnon movement, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the Boogaloo Boys, and Antifa, right? Which you would presume that most of these are associated with the right, associated with Trump. They're not asking us about BLM. Do you ever support BLM? Anybody on this jury panel? No. How about the ACLU? Anybody ever support the ACLU here? No questions on that. How about the Southern Poverty Law Center? Anybody here support that? Southern Poverty Law Center? Or maybe how about the Anti-Defamation League? Anybody here supporting that one? So none of those questions, right? Or any of these groups. They say that these are you know, opposite groups and you can't talk about their groups, right? That's a no-no. Do you have any strong opinions or firmly held beliefs about whether a former president may be criminally charged in state court? If you think this is like unconstitutional, you gotta let us know. Do you have any feelings or opinions about how Trump is being treated in this case? If you think this is unfair, you gotta go. Can you give us your assurance you're gonna decide this case solely on the evidence you see in this courtroom? Do you have any strong opinions about Trump, the fact that he is a current candidate for president, is that going to impact you from being fair? Have you read or listened to any of these podcasts or any of these people's books from Michael Cohen or from Mark Pomerantz? If so, let us know. And if you read it, can you still be fair and impartial? And they're, oh yeah, totally. Disloyal, a memoir. I think that was Cohen. I don't know. Mea culpa, the podcast, Cohen. People versus Trump. That might've been Pomerantz. I don't know. Revenge. Is that Cohen? Another book? Man, he just keeps publishing books, trying to make a buck. And all his weird fans are like, yeah, more Cohen. How could you want more Michael Cohen? Oh my gosh. Now the defendant in this case has written a number of books. Have you read or listened to one of Trump's books? If so, which one? And do you have any opinions about the legal limits about political contributions? Can you promise to set aside anything you've heard and follow the law? And can you give your absolute assurance that you're gonna refrain from watching this case with anyone in any manner from watching, reading, or listening to any other information in this case? And can you assure us that you're gonna follow the judge's instructions on reasonable doubt and the presumption of innocence. They say the Constitution has no burden for Trump to introduce any evidence. If Mr. Trump chooses not to testify or to introduce any evidence, can you give us your assurance that you're not going to hold that against him? Is there any reason, bias or otherwise, that would prevent you from being fair and impartial if you're selected in this case? And that is the conclusion of 
of the jury instruction. So the judge doing his very best try to root out any potential mega jurors lest they interfere with the conclusion and the outcome that they want in this case. The media also got their instructions. You see here, date is jury selection started followed by the trial. Room 1523, closed circuit audio visual feed. So we don't get to watch any of this. Courtroom opens 9.30 a.m. Press can arrive 7 to 7.45. This trial is going to go six to eight weeks, but Wednesdays are not in session. So we'll be here Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday with trial coverage. Wednesdays, we'll get another update on whatever else is happening. Trial seating. So 114 seats, press pool organized of six journalists and one courtroom sketch artist. No sketches of jurors allowed. Overflow room, 58 journalists can apply. Seats are first come, first serve. Exit of the building, one seat per news outlet. Pool and reserve seats, 750 for the balance of the seat. Still video. So you see, right? Now here are the rules. Press with approved credentials can use laptops. Okay, so if they're inside these rooms, then they can use laptops, probably watch it and then live tweet it. No cell phone use, no video, no photographs, no audio recording. Journalists may pack lunch, but no glass containers. Cell phones can only be used in that room for texting. Otherwise, you're limited. So the trial is, again, locked down as can be. They don't want us to see anything that's happening here because they are prosecuting and trying to eviscerate their political opponents. And it's disgusting. So we know what's happening in New York. It's corrupt. It's political. This is an attorney general called Matthew Whitaker explaining the same. Matt, really not a surprise. They asked for a delay to get a new judge. They asked for a delay to get a new location. No and no. Yeah, it's not surprising that New York doesn't want to give up its grasp, especially Manhattan. But, you know, if you look at the numbers, the, the president's filing included a poll of 2,000 people in New York County, which is Manhattan. And what it found was 61 percent of those people polled think that Donald Trump is guilty of these crimes. Secondly, in 2020, New York City voted by 76 percent to 23 percent for Joe Biden. So obviously getting a fair jury panel is impossible. Now, all this court said is, well, let's try to pick a jury and see if we can get 12 people that can be fair and impartial. But I worry that many, because of the high profile nature of this case, are going to want to be on this jury and aren't going to be honest with the court during jury selection. It's Absolutely. Very it's a city of activists. Right I don't know century. if people notice uh, that's who's stopping Trial our roads the every day. They accuse President Trump falsifying, lying about 34 business records, 12 ledger extensions, 11 invoices and 11 checks. But the source is Michael Cohen. He's got some meth. He's got some truth problems. He is a convicted perjurer. He has lied and lied to Congress. And there are allegations that he lied again in the Letitia James case because Alina Abba was questioning him about this. And he says, basically, yeah, I was dishonest there. So a federal judge has already confirmed their star witness is a lying hack. Alvin Bragg wanted to dismiss this case. Southern District of New York, the feds dismissed it. Judge Murkan has a biased daughter who is literally working for Joe Biden and other Democrat candidates adverse to Trump, but he's scheduled the trial to go because they are beginning with the end in mind. They've already got an outcome that they are trying to reach. The trial's just an annoyance, okay? They're just driving towards a conviction, a felony conviction that they can continue to rub around all of America throughout the 2024 election season. But I think that people are going to start to wake up and realize ultimately what's happening here. It is a kangaroo court and we're going to be part of the effort to expose it, bringing the truth of what's happening to light as we cover this trial and the other Trump litigation here. And we appreciate you joining us as our coverage continues, my friends. Thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you for liking this video. Thank you for inviting a friend or family member to come over and join us or just for simply sharing this video with someone you know or love, letting them know what's happening here. Our members only community as well at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. If you want to catch some additional content, some morning streams, some Saturday streams. We'd love to have you join us. We'll see you there and back here on the next one.